So it is good to be back here with you again now. And we're going to talk about what we are doing with formal methods. You know, it's all about trust. Why do you use a ledger? Because you want trust. Thank you very much. Why do you use a ledger? Because you want trust. Well, why should you trust the ledger? Hey, it's asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant. But why do you think it's asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant? We have a math proof. Two years ago, we proved it. Well, why do you think the math proof is right? Well, people have looked at it, and if you're a mathematician, you can read it, and mathematicians don't make too many mistakes, but sometimes do. Okay, so maybe we should go one step further. Maybe we should actually have math proofs where computers are checking them. And then the question is, well, did the code actually implement that algorithm? Well, maybe we should go another step further and have the computer check that too. So this is formal methods. And so my, my purpose right now is not to teach formal methods, because I don't even understand it myself. The important thing is I want you to get a, get a feel for what it is. I think that this is something very important to Hedera and even important to computer science in general. And we're at the very early stages of formal methods, and I think they're really important. And I thought you might just find it entertaining to see it. And it's kind of cool. And if you're into programming or into math, you might like formal methods because it's sort of like a mashup of programming and math. And you might find it kind of fun. So that's what we're talking about. How can we get the computer to be doing these things? So what do we want to do? We want to have math proofs of various things that are checked by the computer. There have been lots of cases where human mathematicians make mistakes. Even math journals publish theorems that are turned out to be false. The four killer theorem was found you know, over a decade later to be false after it was first proved. We want to have proofs that have been checked by a computer. To my knowledge, there haven't been any computer checked proofs that have later been found false. Then we want to be able to prove that an algorithm is good, like hash graph consensus is asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant. And then we want to be able to prove that the source code is correct, meaning our Java program that implements something, the something it's implementing actually is this algorithm we just proved is correct. And then you prove that your compiler is correct, and your JVM is correct, and your operating system is correct, and your chip is correct, and guess what? People are actually working at every level of that stack right now, building proofs of correctness. And this is incredibly important. So, the math proofs being checked for us is in a system called COQ. That's not the official name, I'm the correct way to pronounce it, but I'm just going to spell it out. It's COQ, and it is a proof assistant, which means it doesn't just check your proof. That would be, actually, it's really hard to write a proof that can be checked by a computer. It actually helps you develop the proof, and you kind of work together. So the COQ proof assistant, and then we're going to use this to prove that the algorithm is good for us. That's proving that the hash graph consensus algorithm is ABFT, is asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant. If you recall, Byzantine fault tolerant means we will come to consensus if less than a third of the computers are malicious, and we will know when we've come to consensus, and no malicious computer can make us come to different consensuses. We will come to a consensus consensus, and we will be true, and it will always be right, and it will always make progress, and no one can stop us, even if you have problems with the internet itself, like DDoS attacks and firewalls and bad things. That's what BFT is. ABFT says we can survive the DDoS attacks and the firewalls. So this is what we want to have the computer check. This is a long proof. It was published two years ago. Um, you know, all the mathematicians that have looked at it like it, but that maybe is wrong. Maybe they just were not paying close attention. So maybe a computer should check it. Spoiler alert, a computer has checked it. You can download it right now from our website. I love that. COQ code. And then we want to prove that the source code is correct. In other words, we want to prove that the Java that is implementing this algorithm is actually implementing this algorithm. And that's our next step. We'll do that. We'll use tools like Krakatoa or maybe Caucus, uh, COQ itself to generate the code to do this. And we will um, do that as our next step. And then in addition, of course, we're releasing the source code for open review. And so anybody will be able to, and we're releasing the COQ proofs as open review or just releasing them, and so then you can run it yourself. And right now, you can run the COQ IDE right now on the proofs and see that they're right. So that's where we are. That's where we're heading. So I just want to give you a feel for what this is. So what is it? Well, first of all, it's broken up into lots of files. Here's a whole bunch of files. These are libraries that you write, 
and I put them on the screen in the order that they depend on each other. So the top one is order. That's what order do we put our transactions in or our events in. And then it is based on median. Well, we have to, we're taking the median time, so we have to know what the median is. By the way, for everyone taking a picture of this slide, um, this is one of the files in the zip file you can download right now from Hedera.com. If you go to the bottom of the, of the home page, it says security, something security on the left side. And that um, gives you a link to download this zip file that has this picture and also has um, all the actual .v files that are like source code. So you can download it right now and play with it. And download COQ. It has instructions on how to download COQ and install it. And it's a, a system that you can use. And so you can see how everything depends down all the way to the bottom at TACT, which is a bunch of tactics. We'll talk about those. So those are strategies for how COQ should be thinking, which is fascinating. So we have that. So what do they look like? If you were to click, when you, if you were to run the HTML file, open it up in your browser that I just showed you, you could click on the word C's, and it would take you to the actual C's.html file, which was generated from the .v file. This is one of the files. This is one of the libraries in the proof. And it defines what does it mean to have one event see another one in the hash graph. And what does it ha mean to have one event strongly see another one in the hash graph? And some little facts about it, like the strongly seen lemma. That's the foundation of the entire proof. That's in this file. That makes it kind of an interesting file. It's sort of low level early on in the proof, but it's the first really big step in the proof, where we prove something really significant. What does it look like? Well, those blue boxes are generated from the comments. So this is sort of like Javadoc, but it's for COQ. And uh, I actually typed in those comments. But you'll notice that Carl Crary did the real work. He is an associate professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University. He is amazing. I am really lucky to have him working with us. And he did this entire proof. The entire math theorem, I mean, the entire math proof that was published a couple years ago is now in COQ and can be checked by COQ. You just download it and push a button, and it says uh, everything is green. Carl did that. He is a world expert in this. And so I just put in some blue boxes, but the rest of it he did, the real stuff he did. And you can see that it starts off with some importing some other files. I told you they depend on each other. And then there is a definition of C's. And then below that, there's the definition of strongly C's, STC's. And we just make up definitions. It's very familiar. When you do math proofs, you make up definitions and axioms, and then you have lemmas and theorems, and it's all the same stuff. And this is what a COQ file looks like. So if you want to do some math in COQ, you can. And it's just fun to play with. There's a bunch of tutorials out there. Uh, if you're inclined in this sort of direction, I'd, I'd encourage playing with it. It's kind of fun. So this is what it looks like. Now, you could, I love these giant screens. So you can look at this. Uh, this is, I showed you two definitions. This is a lemma and another lemma. Lemmas are like little theorems that we want to prove. They're the same as theorems. So we want to prove C's implies ancestor. If I can see you, then you're my ancestor. Now it's events, our messages that see each other and our ancestors of each other. Ancestor is something that comes from the, the hashes connecting them. So what this says, the first lemma is proving that C's implies ancestor, very simple. The second one says, well, strongly seen is if all that stuff applies, then, um, then false, which means those things will never happen. It's something about strongly seen. What does strongly seen mean? It's kind of defined here. So let's talk about how these definitions can be read. And I'm just going to go through it. You know, it does, isn't really important, but it's just kind of fun to see how would you read the COQ file and understand it. And if you know any logic, if you've ever seen first order predicate calculus or any of that stuff, this will look pretty familiar. Or if you're a programmer, you may find it's you know, vaguely familiar. There's ands and if thens and all sorts of things. So let me just tell you what seeing is, first of all. In the hash graph, the circles are these events, these messages that we've sent. And then the lines are the, represent the hashes. And so basically, y was created right after that one on the left, which was created right after that one on the right, which was created after x. So x is an ancestor of y. So y can see x if there's some path from y down to x in the hash graph. That's seeing, oh, except for one other thing. What if y also has as its ancestors z and z prime and their forks? If you are doing things correctly as a node 
every time you create a new message, every time you create a new event, you include the hash of the previous one you cre created. That's what you're supposed to do. But if you're a bad person, you're a malicious Byzantine node, maybe you don't do that. Maybe you leave out the hash, or you put the wrong hash, you make up a fake hash or something. So I have two events that neither has each, the other as an ancestor. They're a fork. Don't do that. So what we say here, if Y has as its ancestors this fork, Z and Z prime, and they were created by the same person who created X, then we just say Y recognizes that you're a cheater and doesn't see you. So Y does not see X. That's the definition of seeing there. Okay, so we say Y sees X as long as X is an ancestor, but there's no forks in our ancestry. So this is how you say it in COQ. The first white box, the blue again is the comments. The first white box is, I should point up there, that's what you're looking at. The first white box says definition, sees, x, y, colon, event, colon, prop. If you're a programmer, that looks sort of like we're saying, hey, there's this function sees that given an x and a y that are both events, returns true or false, a proposition. Or if you're a logician, you might say, oh, this is a predicate. A proposition, sees x, y is a proposition that says y sees x. Okay. Or if you just know English, you might understand from what I just said that that's what it means. Good enough. And if you don't understand English, then probably my talk's not very helpful. So this is how you tell it. I'm going to tell you what the word sees means. I'm making up a new word sees. This is the definition. And then the definition is the thing on the left. And what it says is y is an ancestor, x is an ancestor of y, and it is not the case that there exists a z and z prime that are a fork. What I mean by fork, I mean that z is an ancestor of y, and z prime is an ancestor of y, and z and z primes are forks of each other, and the creator of z is the creator of x. I just kind of said it in the same way um, you would say it in English. You may have noticed that there's a slash and a backslash next to each other, making like an upside down V. Does that look familiar? It's exactly like conjunction in logic. Guess what it means? It means conjunction in logic. It's kind of cool. We're using ASCII art to do math. And you might think that that tilde looks almost like that funny not symbol in logic. Hey, guess what it means? It means not. Cool. And that at equals, meaning is an ancestor in the hash graph, that's an awfully funny thing for, co for COQ to have included in the language itself. Well, it didn't. We made it up. You're actually allowed to define your own symbols. How fun. You can overload symbols. So in COQ, we said, hey, at equals, in an earlier file, at equals means it's an ancestor. And so you can just read this. If you've ever seen logic before, it looks pretty familiar. First order predicate calculus or whatever. This is actually a superset of that. This is from the calculus calculus of construction, which is a kind of typed lambda calculus. It's really cool stuff. And, um, and you don't actually have to understand it to use COQ. Uh, sort of basic logic would be enough in a lot of ways. And there's tutorials that teach it. And, you know, it's kind of neat. So this is how you define something. OK. Then we have, how do you prove something? So let me show you. A proof. I'm going to show you a proof of the strongly seen lemma. It is the first lemma in the paper that has a name, the strongly seen lemma. And that's because it's the foundation of the whole thing. Basically, it says, sometimes we say that, that one event not only sees this other event, it strongly sees it. And then you can say something really cool. If you have two events that are forks, they can't both be strongly seen. If somebody strongly sees this one, they can't strongly see this one and vice versa. You can at most see one of the two. Uh, strongly see one of the two. That's the strongly seen lemma, and it lets us prove everything else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this lemma's proof. First of all, informally, I'll tell you the lemma. Actually, I just did. I'll tell it to you again. And then I'm going to give you an informal, hand-wavy proof of why it's true. Then I'm going to use math journal jargon, the way you would see this if a mathematician writes it up and show you the proof in that format. That's what I published two years ago, and you can, you can read the paper. Then I'm going to show you how COQ does it. And you'll get a feel, then, for what the COQ way of proving things is. My goal here is not to teach you COQ. My goal is just to give you a feel for what formal methods are. And why do they matter? Because I think it is the only way that we can have real trust in software. 
I think ultimately, if you want to make sure that your self-driving car is not hacked into and doing bad things, is we're going to have to use formal methods to show it. If you really want trustworthy things, ultimately we're going to have to do formal methods and really prove it, have a computer prove it. Because if anything from the history of software has ever taught us, software has bugs. And if, you, if your program has one bug and you fix it, now how many bugs does your program have? Two. That's how software works. COQ and formal methods is how you fix that. So let's go. The strongly seen lemma says that if V, uh, well, first of all, you have to know what strongly seen is, but it says that if any event strongly sees X, then it won't see, strongly see a fork of X. That's the strongly seen lemma. And what is strongly seen? Well, if this is a hash graph, you'll notice that V can see X, because there's lines connecting V to X that all go downhill. In other words, V has the hash of an event that has the hash of an event that has the hash of an event that has X. Furthermore, there's lots of lines, lots of paths from V to X. In fact, V sees X through all these different green circles, all these green events. And if they were created by more than two-thirds of the population, then we say it is strongly seen X. So that's strongly seen. Okay. So that's the informal definition of the lemma. I am now going to prove it to you in an informal way by drawing pictures without any words. So there's the limit at the top in the informal way I said it. And now I'm going to prove it to you by showing pictures and hand waving. Here we go. V sees X. I'm going to draw that, that previous picture in a slightly simpler way. You just have V. I keep pointing at the thing you can't see. Sorry. That thing shows the same thing. The V sees through various paths all the circles that are not, not drawing inside of this big green set. And then everything in the big green set can see X. So I'm not going to draw all the little circles. I'm just going to say, this is saying that V sees every single circle in the green one, and every single circle in the green one sees X. OK? And I even put in there more than 2 thirds. By the way, I'm going to keep saying more than 2 thirds of the population. That's not actually how the theorems work. It's not actually what the COQ proof works. It's actually more general. It's when you're doing proof of stake, you don't count computers. You count stake of those computers. So the, th the proof is not that you're secure if, t if less than a third of the computers are malicious. It's better than that. It's if the owners of less than a third of the stake are acting maliciously. So if you look at all of the H-bars, less than a third of your H-bars need to be owned by nodes that are acting maliciously. That's what it's based on. So yes, you have to know N, the total number of H-bars. I've heard people say we have to know N, the number of computers. Well, only if you did it that way. But if you're doing proof of stake, N is the number of H-bars, and it's 50 billion. We have created them. We've started our network. It is running. We have 50 billion H-bars. There will never be another H-bar. No more, no less. It'll always be 50 billion. So that more than two-thirds means a bunch of computers created events, and together they owned more than two-thirds of the stake. That's what it's saying. Now. The other one we're going to imagine is some event W that can strongly see Y. And we're going to imagine that X and Y are forks. In other words, we want to prove that this picture is impossible. I am now going to prove to you the strongly seen lemma, which is simply the statement, this picture is impossible. You could never have V seen X, strongly seen X, at the same time that somebody is strongly seen Y if X and Y are forks. And here's why it's impossible. You ready? This is it. The green circle is more than two-thirds of the world. The blue circle is more than two-thirds of the world. So their intersection must be more than one-third of the world. If you think about it, that's actually true. It's sort of a generalized pigeonhole principle. If more than a third of the world is green, and more than a third of the world is blue, then more than a third of the world is more than two-thirds and more than two-thirds, then more than one-third is both green and blue. OK? So all of the events in that intersection in the middle, middle area must be seen by V and W and must see both X and Y. Furthermore, what was our assumption? Less than a third malicious. You have to assume that for any kind of BFT system with a bad internet. And so less than a third are malicious. Well, now wait. 
if that middle area is bigger than a third and the red area is less than a third, there must be a gap. There must be some honest people in the middle there, some events created by honest people in the middle. In other words, there must be some events that are blue and green but not red. Okay, let's draw some. So maybe Alice is honest and she created A and B. Maybe there's a bunch of people in the middle there, but I'll just look at Alice. So maybe she created A and B. And then what we're saying is that V sees A and W sees B and A sees X and B sees Y, maybe something like this. So in order for this picture to happen, there must be an honest person because they're honest, they're not forking, so Alice must have put hers in order the way she's supposed to, and they must be seeing X and Y. And if they are seeing X and Y, wait, A can see B, but B can see Y. That means A can see Y, but A can see X. So if we're going to have a picture like this, we'd have to have A, that event, seeing both X and Y. But we just said that if you ever have an ancestor that's forking, if you can see both sides of the fork, you don't see it at all. It's not possible for A to see either X or Y. Once X and Y become ancestors of A, A can't see either of them. But it's in that intersection where it's supposed to be able to see it. Contradiction. This picture is impossible. We're done. Well, that's kind of mind-boggling. Proof by contradiction is weird to begin with. But this is it. If V could see X, strongly see X and W could strongly see Y, then there must be a blue circle and a green circle, and their intersection must be bigger than the red circle. So there must be some stuff in the intersection that's not red, which means that it's by an honest person, which means it forms a single sequence, which means that whatever the top one is that sees X can also see Y, that's impossible, so this whole picture is impossible. So it's impossible for two forks to both be strongly seen. There you go. That's the strongly seen theorem uh, given in a hand wavy way with pictures. That is not what you would see. <laughs> I started to hear applause. That's not what you see in a math journal, but this is what you might show in a classroom. What would a math journal look like for this? Would it look the same way? No, mathematicians are boring. It would probably look something like this. Lima 5.12, strongly seen lima. If the pair of events x, y is a fork and x is strongly seen by event y in the hash graph, x and y will not be strongly seen, strongly seen by any event in any hash graph B that is consistent with A. Right. And then the proof is even more fun. There's the proof. It's only a paragraph. That's kind of cool. But it's a very dense paragraph, and there's no pictures to even help you. And you have to kind of, it's like reading legalese. The party of the first part, talk to the party of the second part. It's anyway. So this is how a mathematician would do it. And mathematicians can read that. They can read a 20-page paper, and they can read the original paper from two years ago and see that it's right. But mathematicians sometimes make mistakes, especially if they're not really highly motivated. They might just kind of scan through it and make mistakes. So we want to go beyond this. This is a high bar already, but we want to go beyond that. What we want to do is have COQ do it. So what would the theorem look like in COQ, the lemma, I should say? It's a little theorem. What would the lemma look like in COQ? Well, there's the comment that says, Stuff. The lemma is the strongly seen lemma, and it says for all whatever, for all, like an upside down capital A in logic, that's what it means. For all these variables, if V is a member of a hash graph and W is a member of a hash graph, then, and X and Y are forks of each other, and V strongly sees X, and W strongly sees Y, then you may conclude false. False is true. Well, false is never true. We shouldn't be able to conclude that, which means the four things I was anding together can't all be true at the same time. This is how you do it. In COQ, this is how you say, those four things will never happen at the same time because if they all happen at the same time, that implies false. And now we're actually going to do a math proof of false. We're going to assume those four things and prove that true is false, and then the whole world collapses into a black hole, and we are done. <laughs> Proof by contradiction. Okay, so let's do that. What does that look like in COQ? Here's the fun part. We don't actually type in a proof. In COQ, we get to play with an integrated development environment, an IDE, that looks like this. 
The blue box is what it tells you. The, stu the stuff below the blue box is what you type in. You type in stuff down there at the bottom, and then it tells you stuff at the top. And it is a lot like playing one of those old text adventure games. Have you ever played those? They were so much fun. Well, for me, they were so much fun. It's a teenager anyway. They don't exist anymore. Actually, they do. Interactive fiction still exists. Um, yeah, games like Photopia that are amazing. So you have this. I type in at the bottom, proof, period. Meaning, yeah, please, I'm ready to start proving the thing I just told you. And it replies, I understand. You have one sub-goal, which is to prove the thing you just told me. And then draws this line, and there's nothing above the line, because I'm not making any assumptions yet. What you want to prove is the stuff below the line, which is the exact thing I showed you on the previous slide. So when I say proof, period, I'm saying, I want to prove the thing I just proved. And it tells me, OK, you want to prove the thing I just said. Uh, not the thing I just proved. I want to prove the thing I just said. And it replies, OK, we'll prove the thing you just said. There's your goal. It doesn't do it for me, but it tells me that's where I am. Then I say, hmm, you know what? We didn't talk about this, but in logic, all those arrows are like logical implication. And in, in Boolean logic, if you say A implies B implies C implies D implies E, that's equivalent to saying, well, if A and B and C and D are true, then E is true. You know what we should do? We should break up those four things and put them as assumptions, and then just prove the final then part. Let's do that. Let's just destroy this thing, destruct it. We'll do self-destruction on this thing and break it up into its pieces. So we are going to tell COQ a tactic called destruct. I love this term. And we will de I lied. Sorry, we're going to start with intros. I lied to you. We're going to do intros first. Intros says we'll just take it apart. Let's introduce some new variable names. And so I am giving names now. After the word intros, I give names to all the pieces. There's the pieces. And so like HSSX, that yellow one there, is my name for the hypothesis that V can strongly see X. And we're also going to assume that VW can strongly see Y, and we'll call that hypothesis HSSY. And then we have one about forking the members and members and stuff, and what types things are. Actually, everything's a type in this language. It's really cool how types do everything. It's a type lambda calculus. So now we're saying, given all these hypotheses, let's prove false. Now let's be more destructive. Now we get to do destruct. I jumped the gun on that. Now that we've introduced stuff, I say, hmm, I would like to destruct that yellow one. So here's what we say. The yellow one is the hypothesis that V strongly sees X. Well, there is a definition of strongly sees. So we can just plug that in right there and then plug in V's and X's where the variables are. Just substitution. So let's do that. Let's destruct it by doing substitution. Let's destruct that HSSX. And so it turns into this big yellow box. Destruct HSSX as, and then I have to give names to the three pieces that were created as a result. That V prime is an event, and that hypothesis V is that V prime is an ancestor of V, and then the rest of the stuff that came from the definition, where you plug in the Vs and the Xs. And so then you just keep playing this game, and it feels like a game. It feels a little bit like, program like programming. It feels a little bit like doing math proofs. And it feels a lot like playing an adventure game, to me at least. It's kind of addictive. It's like playing a video game. Uh, you keep getting these feedbacks, and you just try this and try that, and you're kind of going back and forth, and COQ is doing the work, and you're doing the work. This is the whole proof. The thing I did with hand-waving with those circles, that is this. And you can see it has lots of different tactics. Destruct and intros are just two of the tactics. Many of the tactics are built into COQ, and some we invent ourselves. You notice the bottom file that we had shown in that earlier diagram was tact. It's a bunch of tactics that Carl wrote. And so we just give it tactics. We don't give it the proof. We tell it how to do the proof itself. And a lot of times we have the word auto, which says, hey, COQ, do whatever you think feels good right now. And it does. It cleans things up in various ways that it thinks looks good. That's what um, uh, auto does. So this is what a proof is in COQ. It's not actually a proof. It's more like a conversation with the computer, giving it advice on how to do proofs. 
And what you end up with, though, is an actual proof under the hood that it has generated, and then it checks it and knows it's true. And so you get a much higher level of certainty. Next step, we'll use something like Krakatoa maybe to prove that our Java code compl uh, complies with the algorithm. Or maybe we'll just use COQ. You can push a button, and COQ will write the program for you. If you've described an algorithm, it'll spit it out in OCaml or Haskell or Scheme, one of those functional languages. And then maybe we could use a Java interpreter of that, or we could translate it to Java, or we just use it directly. Um, or maybe we'll use Krakatoa and prove that the Java code's right. Yeah, we haven't decided yet. We'll do one of those things. That's our next step. And then we'll extend the algorithms and prove that the extended algorithms are good. And then we'll prove that the compiler and the JVM and the OS and the microprocessor are good, but we won't do that. Other people can do that. And so that's it. My intent was not to teach you COQ, to not teach you formal methods, but when you hear the term formal methods, and we talk about it a lot, I just wanted you to understand, have a feel for what we're talking about. And hopefully you got a feel for it. And furthermore, this is fun. If you're at all inclined in this direction, download COQ and download our, our .v files and just play with it. It's just kind of interesting. Um, anyway, I hope that was a, somewhat entertaining for you. I hope it was somewhat informative. Thanks a lot, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you a little bit later. Thanks.